Good evening, Fellowship family. I'm so honored and delighted to be here with you tonight for this week's Bible study. As we journey through the book, the book of Luke, I will be presenting to you the chapter, uh, chapter 11 of the book of Luke. So let us begin with a word of prayer. Gracious God, how thankful we are for your mighty hand in our life. We pray that you would continue to keep us, oh God, and watch over us, Lord. We thank you, oh God, for the vehicle of streaming, God, where we can hear your word and come together, oh God, and learn more about you. Lord, we pray that you would open up our hearts tonight to hear a word from you. Father, we thank you for illuminating our minds and our hearts this evening. In Jesus' name we do pray, amen. All right, so let's get right to it. So um, Luke, the chapter uh, 11 from Luke is all about prayer and conflict. Um, Luke 11, 1 through 13, Jesus teaches the disciples about prayer and shares stories of how those who follow him are blessed in Luke uh, 9, 51 and 11 and 13. Luke 11, 14 through 54 describes how Jewish religious leaders will fully reject Jesus, ending an in an intense description of their sin. Next slide, please. In the interest of time, I will be reading all of the scriptures, but I want you to go back and read the scriptures for yourself because I will be moving through them very, very quickly. Um, so tonight, I... I um, did it in three sections. I wanted us to have three sections of an outline for this chapter. So Luke 11, 1 through 13, we'll see the witness of prayer. Luke 11, 14 through 32, we'll see the casting out of demons and the witness of Jonah. And Luke 11, 33 through 54, we'll see the witness of the woes. Next slide, please. All right, next slide. So let us dig into this, the witness of prayer. I just wanted to read this for your hearing um, tonight, and if you can follow on your screen, we'll be reading Luke 11, 1 through 4 from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. And it reads, he was praying in a certain place, and after he had finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So he said to them, when you pray, say, Father, may your name be reverenced as holy. May your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive our sins as we ourselves forgive, forgive everyone indebted to us and do not bring us to the time of trial next slide please um, I'm sorry can you go back one I'm so sorry um, before we go any further I just wanted to make a note here that um, in Luke it does not say uh, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil we see that in Matthew's version so here we find Luke's version of the Lord's Prayer which is also found in Matthew Luke is has to consider uh, he's he's a little bit shorter in two to four verses and the much longer verse is in found in Matthew it's part of of the Sermon on the Mount in the Gospel according to Matthew, like I just mentioned. Chapter 6, verse 9 through 13. Jesus is teaching his disciples how to pray, and the form that Matthew um, stresses in his, in his version of it is, eschat is eschatological. So it talks about the doctrine of the end times, of the last thing, the last time, and more. Luke here talks about the emphasis of daily living, which I believe you and I need very much. Jesus was found here praying as it was his custom. Listen, family, Jesus was the son of God, but he was intentional about the time that he spent in prayer with the father. In this time, uh, he concluded his prayer. There was a request from one of the disciples. I firstly would like to point out that one of Jesus' disciples asked him, teach us how to pray. Jesus was not just spending time in prayer, but he was modeling to his followers what this looked like. And although he was a disciple, this man who asked who was a disciple, there was no shame in him acknowledging that there was something that he didn't know. 
Jesus did not shame him or it wasn't a surprise to him of his lack of knowledge, but there was an acknowledgement for the need of prayer as an element in their lives. And in our lives, can we say amen tonight? The truth is, is that prayer is so simple that the smallest child can pray, but great that the mightiest man or woman of God cannot be said to have truly mastered the art of prayer prayer. Jesus knew how necessary it was for his disciples to commune and to converse with God, and he provided a formula or a model for prayer. This is the Trinitarian section. This is a, a section that's a listed in commentary as a Trinitarian section, which involves all three members of the Godhead. The Father is the recipient of our prayers and the Spirit is a gift from the Father to enhance our prayer life. And from what I see here, he taught one of his disciples because he was bold enough to ask. Can you imagine if his disciple did not ask how, teach us how to pray, teach us to pray. But the key here is that the disciples said, teach us to pray, not necessarily how to pray, but it is easily implied that if you don't know how to pray, you can't pray. Our greatest difficulty is not in mastering the specific technique or approach in prayer, though it might be good or helpful. Our greatest need is simply to pray and pray more. Amen, somebody. Let's go to the next slide, please. We see here that Jesus makes a request. There's five requests that Jesus makes um, that we see in this scripture. The first one is, hallowed be thy name. Your kingdom come is the second one. The third one is, give us each day our daily bread. Number four is, and forgive us our sins, for we forgive everyone who in is indebted to us as we forgive, right? And then the last one is, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I added that evil on there, even though it's not in Luke, but in Matthew, because I feel like it actually helps us. So I'm trying to parallel the two. And I think that it goes well together. Next slide, please. The first two deal with God's interests. The first request that God, that God's name would be hallowed. Hallowed be your name, to set apart or sanctify, to treat as holy. Thus, this is the request that Jesus made, that God's reputation would be reverenced by humanity. This calls for us to see the name of the Lord in its sacredness, in that it would be magnified in every area of our lives. His name was so holy that Jews never uttered it. And I've experienced some of those who are close to me who still believe in that they don't fully write out the name of God they won't write G-O-D they'll write G-D because the name of God is holy next slide please the second request was your kingdom come John the Baptist, Jesus the 12, and the 72 had been preaching about the coming of God's kingdom. When a person prays for the coming of his kingdom, he is identifying with the message of Jesus and his followers. Jesus taught his disciples to place God's name, kingdom, and kingdom as top priority. This acknowledges the supreme rule and reign of God. This is the shared desire for God's will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus wanted us to pray with the desire that the will of God, heaven's agenda, would be done right here on earth. The Father is the source of all holiness. Jesus brings the kingdom of God to us and the Holy Spirit accomplishes God's will in us and among us. Next slide, please. So here we see the third request, and I know I'm kind of moving through it quickly, but we only have an hour, and this is a lengthy uh, chapter, so I want to move quickly through it. So the third request is for our daily bread. Give us each, give us each day our daily bread. 
daily bread, not a warehouse of bread. Come on here. The prayer is that our is for our need and not for our greed. Tell somebody in your house. The prayer is for our need and not for our greed. Bread is a general term denoting nourishing and filling food. Bread stands not just for food, but for material needs. Daily means today, positioning God to provide every single day what we would need. The joy we need, the peace we need, the fulfillment we need, the money we need, the physical bread that we need, the healing that we need, the guidance that we need, the joy that we need, that God would provide it every day. And not only that, but today's ration was sufficient because God provided what we needed. This part of the prayer teaches us to place our dependency on God, to rely on God for all of our needs. Additionally, this speaks to God's interest in the everyday things of our lives. I know sometimes we think that, oh, you know, I don't need to pray about that or I don't need to seek God. The Bible says in all of your ways, acknowledge him and he will direct your path. And sometimes we don't acknowledge God, so we miss our brain for that day we miss our guidance for that day we miss our peace and our joy we miss what it is that we need for that day but this word teaches us right here give us our daily bread we are asking God and believing that he's in he's interested in everything that happens in our lives we acknowledge that God is our all in all Amen. And that he's interested in everything that happens in our lives. Next slide, please. The fourth request is concerning man's relationship with God, the forgiveness of sin. And forgive us of our sin, for we ourselves forgive everyone indebted to us. And sometimes I think Matthew says, forgive us of our sin as we forgive those who have trespassed against us. Just, um, just as much as we need daily bread, we need to be forgiven daily. I don't know about you, but I need God to forgive me daily. Lord, I'm sorry for the things that I did, the things that I said, the ways that I thought. I need you to forgive Forgive me for the things that I know about and the things that I don't know about. So just as we need provision every day, we need forgiveness every day. And I want to encourage us tonight that a lot of us are holding on to things and we're not forgiving when God forgives us every day. We want to be recipients of something, but we not we don't extend it to no one. So be encouraged to forgive somebody. Call them tonight. Text them. Say, I forgive you as Christ forgives gives me. Luke had already linked forgiveness of sin to faith. And if we go back to chapter seven, verse 36 through 50, we'll see that. In asking for forgiveness of our sin, a person is expressing their faith in God and that he will forgive them. And that the person that confirms, that is confirmed in their faith, they're confirmed in their faith by forgiving others. As our sins are many and they are called debts. Amen. Next slide, please. Here, the fifth request is lead us not into temptation. You would ask, why do we need to pray such a prayer? God doesn't want us to sin. The meaning is that Jesus' followers are to pray to be delivered from every situation that would cause for them to sin. Jesus realized that his disciples likened to us would be easily drawn to sin. Therefore, Jesus' followers, you and I, hello somebody, need to ask God to help us to live righteous day after day. And I just want us to be clear, while God does not tempt he does send tests to believers as he did his son in Luke 4, 1 through 13. So it's not that we're asking that we don't undergo tests or temptation. Rather, it is a prayer for strength and protection that when we are tested and when we are tempted, that he would lead us not into temptation. Hallelujah. Next slide, please. So we're going to move forward um, into our text tonight, and then now we're going to do 11 through um, 
I'm sorry, verses five through eight. So there's two parables here that I want to talk about. So the first one says, and he said to them, suppose one of you has a friend and you go to him at midnight and say to him, friend, lend me three loaves of bread for a friend of mine has arrived and I have nothing to set before him. And he answered from within, do not bother me. The door is already been locked and my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, even though I will not get up and give him anything out of friendship, at least because of his persistence, he will get up and give him whatever he needs. Next slide, please. So here we see the parable of a man that teaches us about persistence in prayer. This short, par- in this short parable, Jesus desires to stress how open God is to us in prayer and with tenacity we should come to him. Therefore, this parable is asking a friend for three loaves of bread in the middle of the night. It takes much courage. Why? We, see, we have to understand that the custom of that day, a whole family lived in a room together, in one room in the house. On one side of the house, it was raised by a platform where they slept, and then on the ground was all of their animals, perhaps cows and goats and sheep and so forth. So there was no way for the man to come to the door without disturbing the whole household. It took a lot of boldness for the man in this story and so shamelessly to ask his friend in the middle of the night for something that he really needed and something that he really wanted. It was not about friendship that the man got what he needed, but it was he got what he needed out of persistence. God often wants for us to be passionate and persistent in prayer. It's not that God is reluctant and and needs to be persuaded. We can't persuade God by our prayers. Our persistence does not change God, but it changes us. I think that'll preach. It develops in us a heart and a passion for what God wants. Are you persistent in prayer? Are you saying, God, I need you to do what it is that I have before you? Or you just think, oh, well, God is going to take care of it. God wants us to come to him. Just like the woman that went to the judge, the persistent widow that we know that story so well, she would not give up and he gave her what she wanted because of her persistence. So we pray tonight, Lord, help us to be persistent in prayer. Next slide, please. Here we see the second parable that Jesus uses in verse 9 through 13. And it says, so I say to you, ask and it will be given to you search and you will find knock and the door will be open to you for everyone who asks receives and everyone who searches finds and for everyone who knocks the door will be open is there any anyone among you who if your child asks for a fish you would give him a snake instead of a fish or if the child asks for an egg would you give him would you give a scorpion If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the heavenly father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So what does this mean? The second parable notes that the heavenly father gives his children what is good and not what's going to harm them. He notes that the natural father gives good food to their children rather than something that might harm them. You know, as natural fathers and mothers, we, we want to give our children steak and potatoes. We don't want them to eat McDonald's. So how much more will the heavenly father give what is good to his his children. Next slide, please. Jesus encourages the people of God to ask. Not just to ask, but to keep asking and keep knocking and to keep seeking over and over again in the spirit of what? Persistence. 
All three verbs are continuous. Jesus is not just speaking about a single activity. He's saying be persistent. It is, not the la- it is the last part of the pericope of this scripture for me that Jesus says that a good gift, the good, I'm sorry, this good gift is the Holy Spirit, which is what's most important. This is the best gift that we could ever have is the gift of the Holy Spirit. And God not only gives heavenly gifts, but he also gives good earthly gifts. Next slide, please. Here we're going to move on now to the second section of this um, chapter, as I said. So here we see the casting out of demons and the witness of Jonah. So let's begin reading uh, verses 14 through 23. Now he was casting out a demon that was mute. When the demon had gone out, the one who had been mute spoke, and the crowds were amazed. But some of them said he cast out demons by Beelzebub, the ruler of demons. Look him up. It's kind of scary. It's a scary photo. Others, to test him, kept demanding from him, Jesus, a sign from heaven. But he knew what they were thinking and said to them, Every kingdom divided against itself is laid waste, and the divided household fails. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? For you say that I cast out demons by Beelzebub. Now, if I cast out the demons by Beelzebub, by whom do your exorcists cast them out? Therefore, they will be your judges. But if it is by the finger of God that I cast out the demon, then the kingdom of God has come upon you. When a strong man fully armed guards his castle, his property is safe. But when one stronger than he attacks him and overpowers him, he takes away his armor in which he he trusted and divides his plunder. Whoever is not with me is against me, and whoever does not gather will with me scatters. My God today. Next slide, please. So I want to work a little bit here. I think this is such a fascinating text. And so the incident occurs in different settings in the three synoptic gospels in Jesus' opening ministry, Mark 3, 22 through 27, the second cycle of Jesus' ministry in Matthew 12, 22 through 30, and here in this section on opposition in Luke eleven fourteen through 28. And all of them, however, the message is the same. Jesus has the ultimate authority over all evil powers. And Luke, the term demon and demons occur 16 times. And evil in spirit or spirits occur eight times. Jesus always had authority over demons. This was a sign of his messianic power. Demons recognize the authority of Jesus. Jesus gave others um. You like you and I, this power, tell your neighbor in the house, I have the power of Jesus that rests inside me. I have power over demons. Hallelujah. We have power in Jesus name. There is truly power to cast out every demon that we're facing. Demons are subject to the name of Jesus and because there is authority in his name. There's not just power in the name of Jesus. There's authority in the name of Jesus. The Jews in Jesus' day had um, exorcists that they used and they sought to cast out demons from people. But they believed that they had to make a demon reveal his name or its name in order for it to not have, in order to have authority over the demon. And some to this day still believe in that. I've seen that in deliverance ministry. But they had to, they had to get the demon in order to speak. 
in order for you, in order for them to have authority, like I said. But here we see the Holy Ghost. We see the power of God. And when we do deliverance, we should have discernment because the Holy Ghost will show us. We don't need the demon to speak to us. The Holy Ghost will show us what the name of the demon is and what's in operation. And we're able to call it out. If we're graced for this area of ministry, we'll certainly be able to operate in the anointing of it. The Holy Ghost will equip us and speak to us during that moment of deliverance and prayer to show us what it is, to call it up and call it out. This person whom Jesus was casting out, this mute demon, only had been mute because of the demon that was causing the muteness. According to the Jewish thinking of that day, the demon Uh, The demon was impossible to be cast out because it had made the man unable to speak and unable to reveal the name of the demon. So what happened was is that the people saw the great work that Jesus had done through the power and authority on his life. But Jesus knew their thoughts, scripture said. There was a display. This was a display of his gifts in the Holy Ghost that he knew their thoughts. And he knew what they were, and they were two reactions. There were two reactions that were present. Some attributed the working of Jesus to Satan, to Beelzebub, the ruler of demons, and somewhat, and somewhat to see the miracles before them was testing him. They wanted a sign from heaven. The charge was that Jesus was possessed by Satan himself. Like the scribes and Pharisees, they had already rejected Jesus as a false prophet and they had to find a rationale to reason for the blaspheme to be able, uh, they, they needed to find a reason how he was able to drive these demons out. So by their logic, Jesus could not receive his power from God and they could not deny his ability to cast out demons. So Satan himself as the origin became their best alternative. Can you imagine? They believed that Jesus was was doing what he was doing. He was performing under signs and wonders and power and authority because of the power of Satan that he was operating in the power of Satan. But I want you to know that although the prince of demons, it's impossible for the prince of demons to be driving out demons. And that's why Jesus said this was ridiculous, that how ridiculous for Satan to drive out his own demons, that he would be weakening his kingdom. This is why Jesus said every kingdom divided against itself laid waste and a divided household falls. If Satan also is divided against himself, how will his kingdom stand? Jesus responds here like none other with the answer he gave them. But if I cast out demons with the finger of God, surely the kingdom of God has come upon you. With this, Jesus answered the charge against him that he was not partnered with the devil. He was providing, he was showing that God was greater and the gifts inside him were greater through the Holy Ghost than Satan, than any work that Satan could have done. Then Jesus makes a quick illustration proving his work in overcoming Satan. He comes upon him. He overcomes him. He takes from him all his armor in which he trusted. Jesus has not only overcome Satan, but he has disarmed him and divides his spoils. That's what the scripture says. I want you to go back and read it because I'm going pretty quickly here. Um, But go back and read it so you can understand what I'm trying to share here. Next slide, please. Here we find Luke verses 24, Luke 11 verses uh, 24 through 26. The return of the unclean spirit. 
When the unclean spirit has gone out of a person, it wanders through the waterless regions looking for a resting place. But not finding any, it says, I will return to my house from which I came. When it returns, it finds it sweeped and pulled, put in order. Then it goes and brings seven other spirits more evil than itself, and they enter and live there and last state of the person and the last state of the person is worse than before next slide please these few scriptures are important because jesus goes back to the person who was formerly demon possessed so he goes back a few verses up it was vital that the man also accepted that what Jesus was saying about him being the Messiah or he would have ended up in worse conditions than he was before. This person had been delivered from the demons but was not filled with Jesus. Jesus reveals the danger of delivering a person of someone receiving deliverance uh, from a demonic possession without filling their lives with Jesus. Matthew compares this situation to what would happen to the generation of people who were listening to him. This is why that this is why when we get deliverance, when we go through deliverance and when we are delivered from something that has us bound, we have to make sure that we have accepted Jesus as Lord and Savior in our lives, that he is ruling and reigning in every area of our lives. Because if we're not careful, those demons will come back. We will go back to the state of bondage. And not only that, they will come back with seven others. We have to keep our spiritual house clean. When the house is unoccupied, these demons will return. They see that it's vacant and they don't come back alone. This is why we have to make sure that we close every single entryway of the enemy in our lives. We have to pray and fast and find ourselves in fellowship and in community with other believers and read the word of God and have it hidden, hidden in our hearts. This is how we keep a clean house. Next slide, please. Here we see in verse 27 through 28, and it's um, called, this section is called True Blessedness. Let's read it. While he was saying this, a woman in the crowd raised her voice and said to him, Bless is the womb that bore you and the breast that nursed you. But he said, Blessed, rather, are those who hear the word of God and obey it. Next slide, please. Jesus here points out something important and quickly just in two verses. It was no disrespect or dishonor to his mother or any mother. Jesus pointed out the greater and more important connection between himself and those who hear the word of God and keep it. It is more blessed and more important to have, you are more blessed and it's more important for you to have a relationship with Jesus than even being the mother who bore him. So he was saying, no, no, don't, don't say bless my mom, but bless the one who keeps my commandments, who keeps the commandments of God and not only keeps them, not only hears them, but also is a doer of his word. They put it into practice. A theologian put it this way, his his disciples were more blessed in hearing Christ than in his mother in bearing him. My God. Next slide, please. So here we move quickly to the another a major section that I wanted to talk about as we um, move quickly to our end. The sign of Jonah. So Luke here in chapter 11 is dealing with so much. So we have to really pull this thing apart. And here it reads, when the crowds were increasing, he began to say, this generation is an evil generation. It asks for signs, but no sign will be given to it except the sign of Jonah. For just as Jonah became a sign to the people of Nineveh, so the son of man will be to this generation. 
the queen of the south will raise at the judgment with the people of the generation and condemn them because she came from the ends of the earth to listen to the wisdom of Solomon and indeed something greater than Solomon is here. The people of Nineveh will rise up at judgment with this generation and condemn it because they repented and at the proclamation of Jonah and indeed Something greater than Jonah is here. Next slide, please. So let's work here a little bit. So here in verse 29, the crowds were still waiting for a sign. If you remember back up a few, a few verses ago, they were waiting for a sign. They were like, we want another sign from heaven. What you did is not a sign enough. So they were still waiting, but he was not going to give them a sign. He rebuked them instead for desiring a sign. They had experienced countless of miracles and signs that had occurred right before their eyes, but it still wasn't enough. That sounds like some of us today, God, you did it before, you'll do it again, and you're the same God now and same God then, but I still don't believe you. I still don't trust you. I need more signs. I know what you said. You kept your word back then, but I don't know if you're going to keep it now. They still wanted signs, and he rebuked them. It's easily to overestimate the power of miraculous signs to change the hearts of doubters and skeptics. The danger in delivering this, this, I'm sorry, there's no sign that will be given except the sign of Jonah the prophet. That's what Jesus said. That's how he replied. Jesus told us that Jonah became a sign and Jesus would be a similar sign to his generation. Jonah gave his life to appease the wrath of God coming upon others. But death did not hold him after three days and three nights uh, and three, uh, three days and nights of imprisonment. He was alive and free. This is what Jonah 1 through 2 says. This is a sign of Jesus's promise. Jesus is the sign both to he and his present generation and to ours. Jesus himself is the sign. We are to believe in him and not a sign. The queen of the south is also known as the queen of Sheba. She came in Solomon uh, in, in 1 Kings 10. And when she saw the great work that God did through Solomon, she praised the God of Israel. She did not say, show me more and maybe I'll believe. The queen of the south came from the ends of the earth to hear the word, the wisdom of Solomon. She sought after God's word with tenacity and that that would shame us because she was so tenacious. The people who asked Jesus for a sign saw his work right there in their own neighborhood and still didn't believe. The point here is clear is that the queen of the south and the men of Nineveh were both Gentiles and they they had more open hearts to the things of God than the religious people of Jesus's day who would not believe and receive the work that God did right before their eyes. The greater than Solomon is here means that Solomon is the son of David and the one greater messianic title is of Jesus, the son of David. Jesus was the much greater son of David than Solomon. Indeed, greater than Jonah is here means that Jesus replied and brought back the focus upon himself. He was and is the greater one of amongst all the prophets that he shall be and shall forever be. Next slide, please. The witness of the woes we see here in uh, 33 through 36. Let's read it. No one after lighting a lamp puts it in a cellar or under a bushel basket. Rather, one puts it on a lampstand so that those who enter may see the light. Your eye is a lamp 
Your eye is the lamp of your body. If your eye is healthy, your whole body is full of light. But if it is unhealthy, your body is full of darkness. Therefore, consider whether the light in you is not darkness. But if your whole body is full of light with no part of it in darkness, it will be as full of light as when the lamp gives you light with its rays. Next slide, please. Here we find another parable. We are aware that Jesus taught his disciples in parables and still teaches you and I. These two passages are regarding the light of God in this world. Jesus uses the lamp and how it should be on display out in the open so that we can all benefit from the light. So the word and the work of God should be on display. We are the light. We are the salt and the light. And Christ and his word are in display in our lives daily. Therefore, our bodies need to be filled with the word of God. This is what allows us as believers to be filled with the light of Christ. This is how we can be a light in dark places. This is what happens. We, we become full of light when we spend time in the word of God and in the presence of God. Have we lost our light and our salt because we've not spent time with God and his word? How can we be effective on this earth and be a light that shines so brightly for Christ if we're not in Christ? How can we help others overcome without the substance that comes from the word of God? Next slide, please. Here in Luke verses 37 through 44, Jesus denounces the Pharisees and experts in law. Let's read it. While he was speaking, a Pharisee invited him to dine with him. And so he went in and took his place at the table. The Pharisee was amazed to see that he did not first wash before dinner. Then the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees, Clean, Pharisee, clean the outside of the cup and of the dish, but inside you are full of greed and wickedness. You fools. Did not the one who made the outside make also the inside? So give as the alms, so give as alms those things that are within, and then everything else will be clean for you. But woe to you, Pharisee. For you tithe mint and rule and herbs of all kind of neglect, I'm sorry, of all kinds and neglect justice and the love of God. It is those who ought to practice, those who ought to have practice without neglecting the others. Woe to you Pharisees, for you love to have a seat of honor in the synagogue, in the church house, and be greeted with respect in the marketplace. Woe to you, for you are like an unmarked grave on which people unknowingly walk. My God. Next slide, please. Let's continue reading verses 45 through 54. One of the experts in the law answered him, teacher, when you say these things, you insult us too. And he said, woe also to you experts of law, for you load people with burdens hard to bear, and you yourselves do not lift a finger to ease them. Woe to you, for you build the tombs of the prophets whom your ancestors killed. So you are, a wit so you are witnesses and approve of the deeds of your ancestors, for they killed them and, they and you built their tombs. For this reason, the wisdom of God said, I will send them prophets and apostles, some of whom they will kill and persecute, so that this generation may be charged with the blood of all the prophets shed since the foundation of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah, who will perish between the altar and the sanctuary. Yes, I tell you, it will be charged against this generation. Woe to you experts in the law, for you have taken away the key of knowledge. You do not enter yourselves and you inherit 
you hinder those who were entering. When he went outside, the scribes and the Pharisees became hostile to him and began to interrogate him about many things, lying in wait for him to catch him in something he might say. So I want to talk about this, this um, part, this pericope, this big section of the text here, um, and then we will be done for tonight. Hallelujah. So although Jesus experienced increasing conflict and opposition from the religious leaders, he did not hate them in return. He accepted the invitation to eat with a certain Pharisee. Jesus breaks the custom of not washing before dinner. This was unhygienic of him to do this. He did not follow the extreme technical and rigid requirements of ceremonial washing practiced by many of the pious Jews. It was like Jesus had sinned in their eyes as he had committed fornication. That's how bad it was for Jesus to not have washed. So Jesus points out here that the Pharisees make the outside of the cup and the dish clean, but their inward parts are filled with greed and wickedness. How many of us know that sometimes at one point or another, we have done that. We do so good to put ourselves together to make sure that the outer is good and put together and oh, she's cute and oh, he's handsome or whatever, but our inside looks a hot mess. This is what Jesus was dealing with you guys make sure that the outside of the cup and the dishes are clean but what about the inside the inside is where you consume from right when you put some water in a cup in a glass when you put some food a nice steak and potatoes and green beans come on here somebody on a plate you eat from the place that's inside that's where you consume from and the people that are around us they consume from what's inside of of us what are you offering what is on the plate what is in the cup is only your exterior looking good you got it all put together you got matching hat and shoes and purse and accessories and everything else I mean you are you got it put together you walk into a room and all eyes are on you but what does your inside look like it's nasty and it's dirty and your attitude sinks and you're not committed to nothing and you 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 treat your neighbor like you don't treat yourself Come on here. That's what Jesus is dealing with. So these Pharisees were, ca were, were careful to maintain the appearance of righteousness. But this was not their inner reality. They were foolish because they were outwardly clean and filthy inside. Jesus made a statement, but he didn't stop here. He said, woe to you. And he said it several times. Jesus spoke so harshly here that although uh, he was not, he wasn't condemning them, but he wanted them to know that he was serious about this. It was his tone that spoke when he said it to them. Woe is you. Woe to you. Jesus here mentions also tithing. Their tithing was a, a, a way of them getting noteworthy uh, uh, of what they were doing. It wasn't that they were doing it from their hearts unto God, but they were doing it to be seen. Pharisees were so careful in their outward obedience that they would literally tithe from their herbal gardens. They would count the seeds and the leaves, and they would give a tenth of each to God. But this was legalism. They did not do it out of following uh, what, what was right to do by God, but they did it by following the rules and regulations. But God was far from their hearts. How many of us is that today that God is dealing with that we do things and we come to church and we tithe and we show up and we serve because of the legalistic thing, because of the legalistic side of it, not because it's God drawing us or God doing something in us. He's saying, I want you to do it from a place that's sincere in your heart. But he didn't stop there. He said, you love the best seats in the synagogue 
and greeting in the marketplace. The best seats in the church. Uh Uh-huh. You like to be in the front facing the congregation. This is where leaders and permanent people would sit. The people thought that it was good, that you were walking good with God when you sat in the front of the synagogue. Then he goes on and says, scribes and Pharisees were hypocrites. Literally, the word hypocrites mean, refers to an actor, someone who is playing a part. And Jesus exposes the corruption that was covered by the spiritual imagery. Jesus came to deal with them. You hear me? He is dealing with them, and he is also dealing with you and I. This word is still revelatory, and it's still real and, and, and for, for, for us to apply. So then he goes on, and as I close, he says, so one of the lawyers said, uh, one, of the, one of the lawyers answered and said, and what he did was is that he brought attention to himself. The lawyer would have done better to keep quiet, but he drew attention, so Jesus said, I'm going to address you too. And he said, but you load men with burdens and hard, uh, which is hard to bear. And you do not touch the burdens with one finger because of the way that the law was interpreted in that day. The burdens that were placed on, on the people were heavy burdens and they did nothing about it. They didn't care about it. It's, it's, it's like you and I caring about those who have a food insecurity issue or don't have house, safe housing or something like that. They didn't care. Like they kept putting things on the people and the burden was heavy. They didn't care about the, the oppression of people. They just wanted to be seen right (laughs) in the eyes of people, not so much in the eyes of God. So the last thing I want to talk about is the last part here where it says, woe to you for building, for you build tombs of the prophets and your fathers killed them. So they rejected living prophets. So it shows that their children were the murderers of the prophets of the days of old. And that this was expressed in a thought that Jesus uh, wanted to teach here to his disciples. And the last thing I want to share was that he went back to the back to the lawyers for some reason. He said, woe to you lawyers. He said here. The legalistic approach that has taken is taken away from understanding and knowledge by giving the people a list of rules by which they could supposedly save themselves, but it doesn't help them at all. The last thing here, he says, you do not enter in yourselves and those who were entering in you hindered. Who has hindered you and who did you hinder? by the life you live, by the things that you say, I'm a Christian, but do you represent Christ well or do you misrepresent him? Who have you misled? There's a scripture that says, who hindered you? You were running well, who hindered you? And that's what Jesus is dealing with. It was bad for someone to enter. It was difficult, it's difficult for someone to enter heaven and to work out our own soul salvation, but it's worse to hinder another person from entering in. It's horrible when you become a hindrance to someone else. And so the last thing I wanna read here is the last uh, verse of this text that he says the scribes and the Pharisees began, uh, I'm sorry, that they might accuse him. So the religious leaders responded the way that many do when they're faced with correction, with the truth of God. Instead of humbly receiving the correction, they responded in outraged accusations. Proverbs tells us that those who refuse correction, first those who correct them, Proverbs 9 and 8, Proverbs 15 and 12, second, they did not listen to the one correcting them, Proverbs 13 and 1, third, they despise their own soul, Proverbs 15 and 32. Proverbs also tells us that the character of those who refuse correction, they are stupid, Proverbs 12 and 1, and that they are foolish, Proverbs 15 and 5. 
So I hope that this word was a blessing to you. I hope that there's something that you can take away from it. Not all of it, maybe, but maybe something that you can apply to your day to day life. Um, And I hope that and I encourage you to go back and read this for yourself and maybe watch this again so you can get a better understanding. Uh, Now we're going to turn our attentions to the screens um, for media. Thank you so much. We thank you so much for joining us tonight. And we ask that you take this opportunity to bless this ministry, bless this house with an offering. There are a variety of ways for you to give. You can give via Cash App to Dollar Sign FCC Finance, by PayPal to FCC Provision for the Vision at gmail.com, mail a check to Fellowship Covenant Church, give online through our website at www.fellowshipcovenant.church, or give via Zelle to FCC Provision for the Vision at gmail.com. We are so grateful for your generosity, and we thank you for your offering and gifts. Now, please stay tuned for our benediction. Thank you so much for tuning in tonight. We're so glad that you did, and we hope that you will come Wednesday after Wednesday to learn of the Word of God as we continue to journey on. Um, Thank you for your giving also. We pray that you would be blessed in Jesus' name. So let us pray. Gracious God, we thank you for this time in your Word. We pray, Lord God, that it would be seed into the soils of our hearts and into our spirits. Lord, we ask you tonight, God, to help us to be persistent in prayer. Help us to be persistent in seeking you, God. Help us to be persistent in going after the things of you, O oh God. Give us a clean heart, Father. Let our motives be clean, Father. Let our motives be right in you, O oh God. And we thank you tonight, O oh God, for your word. And we ask you, O oh God, to be in us and through us and work in and through us oh God and be with us and cover us father in the name of Jesus we do pray amen God bless you and have a wonderful week